there. We do have a focus session on precisely the subject that came up in a number of your questions and also in some of the remarks that we heard from that panel, namely the issue of large-scale assessment and benchmarking, because clearly the kind of inputs that we're talking about when we talk about the digitally, the technologically enhanced classroom learning or teaching is all about guaranteeing outcomes. So we want to look now at some of the ways that digitalization is supporting that process. We have a focus session uh, that, will, that will address that subject. And once again, we invite you to submit your questions. We have a short window here, but please, if you have a question, do submit it uh, via that pigeonhole tool. So I'd like to ask the chair of our session on assessment and learning outcomes, who is the head of the Department of Survey Design and Methodology at the Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences, Gezes, to please uh, take the stage. Beatrice Ramstedt. Well, thank you for the introduction. And indeed, we have a rather short session now, like 20 minutes uh, before lunch. And I'm very happy to have here two experts with me, two experts in the field of assessing, um, assessing um, in, in a technology-enhanced, um, uh, well, context. Um, so uh, to my left is uh, Katie Tiannan. Katie is the director of the Global Learning Strategy Team for Microsoft's World Education Organization. She supports companies in changing to using more technology-based training, and she de developed education <coughs> transformation models to schools worldwide. So a warm welcome to Katie. Thank you. And, um, and to my further left is um, Professor Christoph Meinl. He is uh, the CEO of the scientific and scientific director of the Hassel Plattner Institute for IT System Engineering. And uh, Christoph is engaged in the development of mocks that are used by a huge uh, adult population worldwide. It, they are used by SAP, they are used by the WHO, uh, and in these uh, mocks they do not only train ICT skills, but also uh, they are including social skill elements, and I think he will talk about that later on. And at the moment, uh, in addition to these adult learning mocks, he, he is um, developing a school cloud, which is funded by the German uh, Federal Ministry for Education and Research. Um, we will uh, um, module this session so that we have two very short uh, presentations, but so each one by each of the uh, of our panelists here, and uh, then we will have an open discussion. Also, of course, including your questions. So, may I ask you, Katie, to please start with your presentation? on your work. Thank you. And I'm very happy to be here. And actually, why I'm here today uh, roots back to the 1990s when I was a freshman out of the university. And it was a big recession in Europe and in Finland. And in Finland, we made a study why companies are not hiring the freshmen out of university. And it was clear they had studied for, you know, plus, you know, 15, 16 years in education system, but they didn't really have those skills and capabilities like ICT competence. It was more expensive to hire freshmen and retrain them in the digital workplace. Now today, we have certainly you know, closed some of that gap, but we see a huge gap now with the second machine age, or is it the fourth you know, version of the industrial revolution, when we see that the routine community jobs is gonna be automated. It's gonna be done by algorithms and machines. So that's why the crucial thing in learning transformation and in assessment is really how we further develop the knowledge based assessment to integrate the skills-based assessment. In the same 1990s, I was also a local policymaker in the city of Helsinki. And, and what we learned there, we were doing a big transformation of curriculum in Finland. We were decentralizing it. But we didn't touch the assessment. So five years later, we realized that if, even though we were trying to change the curriculum, we were trying to change the learning paradigm, but because you get what you measure, we afterwards you know, went to there. 
And now in these uh, you know, national systemic level change projects, I'm working in Europe, Middle East and Africa, you know, my kind of key takeaway is that when you are looking this transformation, you have to look at the curriculum, how that is integrated to the 21st century skills. If you don't change the assessment, nothing is really changing. Because then we can see a few individual schools, few individual you know, teachers creating islands of innovation, but we don't see the systemic change. And the third pillar is the professional development. And guess what? It's not professional development. It's retraining the educators and teachers. There's so much we have to leave behind from the old legacy and build new practices. So what I want to share with you here is a work we have done globally and, and, and in Finland specifically around the new curriculum and how to introduce the, IC, you know, the 21st century skills and how that is changing assessment. And sorry for a quite busy light, but I think this is one of the best way of you know, describing that change. This is work based on uh, uh, Michael Fullan and Maria Langworthy, and it's kind of... Uh, uh, having kind of comparison of the old pedagogies and new pedagogies. In the old pedagogies, when we didn't have access to knowledge anytime, anywhere, it was crucial that we had the content knowledge at the center of the learning. We teach teachers to have some pedagogical capabilities for motivate, make interactive learning. And for the past 30 years, we have been trying to put the technology on top of that, like a sherry on the cake. And I would say, we haven't been quite successful because we don't see the big impact um, in, in learning yet, which it could have. And in the assessment, we were testing students that how they can reproduce the existing content, how they were able to, you know, by heart, uh, reproduce the knowledge they have studied. And in some you know, cases, they were maybe applying the content in the new context, like in PISA research. And technology was a little bit in, engaged there, but not much. What really worries me that I see a lot of digital transformation projects where we, on the you know, policy level, we talk about uh, learning personalization, student-centric learning, digital enhanced you know, learning processes. But when we look how we automate uh, existing learning paradigm with technology, that really makes me sad. So we tend to put the book as a PDF on a tablet. We see technology to be passive consumption of content and knowledge, and not actually the active reproduction and, and being able to understand the content, what is real information, what is opinion, etc. So how Fulan and Langworthy is you know, stating this here is that in the new pedagogies, the technology is a lab where all the learning and learning process should happen, from acquiring knowledge to evaluating knowledge, and for a most, how to build it together. That's why the pedagogical capabilities of the teacher is crucial. What are the teacher's learning design skills to make these pedagogical learning processes happen, which the previous panel was mentioning? And the content is important, but it's ever-changing. Why do we have this kind of political crisis in the world today? Why do we have the question about, uh, you know, alternative truths? I have been, you know, really enjoyed reading Lawrence Krauss. He's an astrophysics as well. And he's challenging us, the education system. Because if we teach and assess knowledge as one truth, and we don't teach the cyclic thinking uh, and the process of academic and research thinking, we get the situation that people no longer trust the science because one day Pluto is no longer a planet. That's why we have to teach and assess the capabilities of a scientific thinking and get students to understand that science is self-correcting method. And that's why I really have been inspired about the deep learning projects, you know, approach to assessment. That there is actually important how learners can identify and build meaningful content. In my youth, the collaboration was called cheating. How do we really, <laughs> how do we really rethink assessment also 
because the teamwork is so crucial in the work life today. How do we, do we find these new ways? So it has been a pleasure for me to work with the uh, new pedagogy of deep learning project now for the past three years in Finland, because um, it's also challenging that now we are you know, developing national policies, but actually we are doing that for the global workforce development and global competitiveness. Uh, we see now a lot of governments rethinking the competencies to be added in the curriculum. And, and of course, I think that, you know, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, these six C's are something that I think we have some kind of worldwide, you know, consensus. And the key thing with this deep learning process was that it was describing in the form of rubrics, what are the different levels of the student skills that how they can show that uh, knowledge and, and skill in the classroom. It has been a challenge, to be honest. Because first of all, today, big part of the learning design happens by book publishers. And if you follow that learning design process, you don't get further than one out of five. This is definitely a big challenge uh, for the teachers on the pedagogical side. The, the situation, I would say, is that we, I haven't yet seen any country who has been on a national and systemic level to be able to uh, integrate the skills into the assessment. Because getting a grade in creativity, you are, you know, B student on creativity, is not very supportive. So I would say that we do have to rethink the, you know, the assessment overall. Are we really thinking about more about the portfolio work? It has to be more about the you know, written feedback. And now we see cities in Finland who has been deeply engaged with the project to develop this kind of you know, uh, transformation tools. But then there's a holy cow in education systems. And that is that, we, that the teachers who are professional of assessing students, which obviously needs to be changed, we are very worried about how, how assessing teachers. And one of the key learnings was uh, in, the, in this North Star project in Finland that was implementing the deep learning, that we have to also give teachers new tools to assess their pedagogical practices. And, and actually what we developed um, together with the National Agency of, of Education in Finland and uh, Professor Kirsti Lonka from the Helsinki University was a self-assessment tool for the teachers that how they can really introduce new pedagogical approaches in their classroom so that we can even expect the learners to get those skills. And the word, you know, um, you know attitudes was mentioned in the earliest panel. We co-created this four level, you know, uh, kind of continuum around the skills where the level zero is exactly the attitude challenge pro problem. As an educator, you think this is not, you know, touching my subject. I don't care about this. This also shall pass. When in the level one, the teacher is aware of those skills, but is not yet able to implement that in the classroom. On the second level, they can also implement the pedagogies, and on the third level, they are deeply engaged and can support others. So, dear audience, I would say that this is something that we can not only leave to the shoulders of individual teachers, we need to have assess, you know, you know, systemic thinking. That's why this kind of forum and the consensus paper you made, it's fantastic. Because in your country, there has to be a certain understanding across the K-12 and higher education, how you see the knowledge in today's world, how you see assessment. Nobody dares to make these steps on its own. We need collaboration. But this to be said, you know, Finland is still seen one of the successful education countries. And still a couple of weeks ago, my daughter was, you know, in an exam, writing on paper with the pen, something that she learned by heart. She still assessed the same way as I was 30 years ago. And, and latest research also shows that we have new risk of, you know, kids who are leaving schools, because if they are highly, um, a digital competent, they don't agree with the knowledge development policies and practices in school and they feel education is irrelevant for them. So I would also say it's time to wake up and smell the coffee and do that systemic transformation fast. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, <laughs> Thank you, Katie for your impulse. Um, I would suggest that we directly follow up with your uh, first statement and that we then enter the discussion. 
Yeah, uh, let's give me a sh chance to give a short background about what we are doing. Hasso Plattner, this is the found, one of the founders of SAP, so Katie is something like a German Bill Gates, and he runs an institute for IT systems engineering to educate IT engineers of the future. When we speak about education, then particularly where we are so close with all what's happening in IT, we see that we need something like a digital enlightenment for the people and that education will be the only what we can do to face all the challenges of digital transformation of our society. If you think about robotic, if you think about uh, what's going on with artificial intelligence, what you hear about that jobs are no more available in future, the only thing we can do is to prepare next generation, to prepare people to be able to face with this. So teaching education is uh, very, very important. So what we are doing, uh, when we speak about digital education, there are things to be done on different levels. We need content, digital learning content. We need formats, formats that fit to the way how we teach, how we learn. And for that end, we need infrastructures. So HPI is doing on uh, all the levels some activities. For example, this is our Teletas system. Since 20 years, we have this mobile system where we can record each lecture, each conference, uh, not only making a video of the teacher, of the lecturer, but also showing what he is presenting. You can use uh, any desktop uh, for that purpose. So it's very, very simple, and in this way we produced over the years many, many lectures, podcasts, iTunes, many people are using this. But when we speak about digital education, e-learning, then it's not very often that you hear people speak enthusiastic about it. So they do this, and it's very convenient to get the access, but there was some very crucial missing. And this is exactly what came in as an innovation with the massive open online courses. The idea here is not only to present the material, but also to synchronize the learners to attract many, many people, so that the learners are all on the same level, and then to marriage is with social media. So first time, e-learning is not only suitable for autodidactic gifted person, but it's suitable also because we get a social dimension to get people interested to discuss with each other like we see this discussion in social media. So we designed a platform for providing such MOOCs, our Open HPI. So it's Germany's largest city hall. We have a lecture hall. We provide their six-week courses about basics, about advanced topics in IT, technology, and we also provide information and courses for what we call digital enlightenment. Here we see and have the possibility to measure and to assess how learning works, what is useful, what's successful, what does not work, because using such electronic systems, the people you can exactly trace all activities and can see why the people left on a video on this point or why they did not be able to make this homework. So we have quite good experience. 25% of the courses, on each course, 5, 10, 15,000 people take place. 25 persons manage the six-week course with two, three to six uh, weeks homework and work and are able to get a certificate. So this is not only the video, but it's also the interactive part, the quizzes. We have the possibility to form learning teams, to give them the mean for peer assessment. It's not so easy if you have uh, five, 10,000 users to do this, and each week the people have to do homework. Infrastructures. When we speak about schools, in Germany, it's a big problem. 
all people say, since 20 years we need uh, digital content, we need digital the possibilities to use the possibilities of digital education. But if we look into the schools, there are 10, 50 old computers. There is no administrator. So the teachers are forced to get run these old computers, to get run it in the right way, to get run the, uh, the uh, content. And typically, the students has, the school has to go in a special room for this. This is not an infrastructure where you can use digital, uh, uh, digital education, apply digital education in the usual class. So what we experiment with together with, an, uh, with a network of 300 excellent schools in mathematics, informatics, naturwitner technics in the, all over Germany to establish a school cloud. So for the teacher, it needs to be as simple. Like for us, when we use our smartphone, click on an app, and then the app works. In this way, it should work with learning content in the school. There is a teaching, uh, teacher bashing that the teachers are not able to use this. It's not necessary to learn to use such thing. It should be easy. And it should be not be a blame in front of the pupils that you try something and because of the old computers and the bad uh, infrastructure, it's not working. So with schoolwork, hopefully we can open a door. Hopefully we can also prevent Germany from providing 16 school clouds because we know in Germany we have the states that are responsible for the schools and each of the states, of course, uh, wants to make its own thing. But such infrastructures, they are the better, the more people uh, they can use. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Christoph, you already hinted to, uh, to the learning outcomes. I saw on one of your slides uh, the word certificate. Um, so what is the way that you really test uh, the, the students um, and how do you confirm that that, that the person himself or herself is the test taker. The thing with the MOOCs is that you need many people uh, to take part to get a very rich interaction in the discussion forums, in the social media. If you do this with 30 or 50 people and someone asks the question, then you get an answer next week. But if you have 5,000 or if you have 10,000 or 15,000 people, then you get the answer within a half minute. So the people stay. So this is a kind of attraction to stay close, like in a classroom, to stay close with this virtual community, uh, uh, learners community. So what students have to be done? They, they, in the week, there are about 10, 15, 10 minutes videos. Then there are self-tests so that the people can check whether they understood the things. And then at the end of the week, they have to do homework. It's one hour. It's an electronic examination. And for each week, they have to do this. We have courses uh, six weeks long. And at the end of the course, they have to do an exam. This is two hours. And in that time, they have to prove that they understood what was done. The self-tests are very important, because in the self-test, you get immediately an answer. And you can find out whether you have understood something. You can question. Why is this wrong? But for the homework, then there is a measurement. There is a measurement, you get the points, and you need 50% of, uh, of the maximal points at over all weeks with the exam to get, an, uh, to get a certificate. And if I can add very shortly, that is a challenge because technology is moving on so fast. So already today, we have solution where the uh, you know, computer camera is identifying the user. So, so it's identifying your face or your eye recognition. This is possible now because of machine learning. So in, in future, that will not be an issue. It also recognizes, is it a picture or is it a really a 3 day person? So technology is able to solve a lot of the things very often we miss about the vision and the courage to really rethink significant new platforms and the way we identify people to be able to order this, you know, and you know, offer these services. But it's totally easy to do these days. Um, we have uh, several questions from, from the auditorium, and one is uh, think, uh, an interest in, uh, in assessing um, 
well, motivation, learning skills, so, so the social skills that are probably mentioned in the introduction that you assess, and I think you have it also in, in your programs. Can you give us some hints how you assess these in, uh, uh, in your courses, in your modules? Well, I, I think one thing is, is crucial that, you know, we have to separate also that when we are, you know, assessing, the, you know, the learning outcomes or what, when we are doing assessment for, lear, for better learning outcomes. And, and in this project where we start to assess skills uh, or attitudes or motivation, it's crucial to have like 360 view, view for that. So it's, it's student self-assessment compared to some kind of rubrics that they understand what the success looks like, peer assessment, teacher assessment, you know, et cetera. So it, is, has, it has to be verbal, but it has to have like different stakeholders participating to the assessment overall. And it's crucial to have some like, tools like the teacher self-assessment tool that you understand what the different kind of capabilities, themes, and, and levels may look like. So we need new tools for students and, and for teachers, but also for parents uh, to understand this. But is social behavior the, the same in such a virtual context as it is in daily life when I talk to you directly here? Well, uh, we very easily see that, you know, digital tools are, you know, taking the social behavior lower and actually research shows the opposite, that those, you know, students and kids who are active in social life, in, in, you know, in private life, they also use the social tools a lot. If the, you know, learner is kind of withdrawing from the social interaction, there's some other issues that needs to be solved, but it's not driven, you know, you know by technology. I would say that if we look now back in the future, the power of the real digital transformation in schools will be the new way of collaborate and share, not only consume. Um, so, so that is the big revolution, uh, because also in businesses and, and public sector entities, you can you know, work from any time, anywhere. You have you know, global collaboration. And we can really see in the project like the pizza for you or how, for instance, uh, Minecraft for education is used, that that creates learning environments where kids are learning this socially responsible and digital experience where they work, work and learn together. Concerning this measuring success, learning uh, success and others, there is an interesting story. When we start, of course, the people get shown how many of the questions you answered in the correct way, and because it's electronic, it's easy to exactly measure what was uh, right, what was wrong. And then we observed, in all these offerings, the people very often click on this, what is my status, what is my status. So then we developed a whole dashboard to show the people, this is task, this task, this task, this is your percentage of the success. And this is very much motivating for the people to go back and to look to another video or to some things. I compare this like a mirror. The people like to look in a mirror. And this measurement dashboard is something like a mirror. Mm -hmm. Talking about the measurement dashboard, uh, we have one question um, on, uh, on the potential of using the media to give us insights in learning strategies in um, in uh, how to design uh, then really a, a course or a program. So it's upcoming in very important area, science in science, it is uh, learning analytics. With this mass data we get, if we uh, run systems with 10,000, 100,000 of people using it, we can see what are the people doing, in which point of a video they stop, step out or which of the question is not answered correctly. And then we can analyze this. Mm -hmm. It's not by a single person, it's by the big data we have. We can analyze this and can try to find out what's the reason, what need to be changed to make this more efficient or to increase the success in a first try to answer a question in the right way. So this is very much uh, encouraging also the teaching teams behind such a course. There is typically a team which also um, um, is a little bit uh, active in the learning, in the discussion forum, moderates sometimes, brings people to other ideas or say, did you think about that? But this teaching team at the end of the course is exactly analy analyzing what can be improved to make it even more 
uh, successful next time. And, and if we add on this also the predictive analytics, and, and you know you need that critical mass of data that your like your platform is now you know collecting, but with predictive analytics of that we can see a trend and a risk of a dropout students beforehand. So if this uh, big data is combined with the productive analytics, we have been able to really ha have huge, huge impact to avoid the dropout risk. But it means that the teachers and the school has to have ways to do in, 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 you know, interventions for that thing. So that's why this analytics offers huge opportunities, but the way the teachers work needs to be changed as well. But uh, it's fantastic because then we can improve the content and if we can improve the class engagement as well, I think that is some of the big things. Well, thank you very much. We are at the end of our very short session and uh, probably at the beginning of the lunch break. So thank you very much once again, Katie and uh, Christopher.